Yo, what's up guys? We're back for another week of breakdown and predictions. And first of all, I just want to say my bad for putting the video out this late. I actually did the video. I recorded it a couple times. So if I'm kind of like short on a few predictions, you'll know why because I've done this like a few times. But uh, and I have an issue with my laptop. I don't know what the issue was. It wasn't um, the video is having an error. So doing this on a on a different um using something different for this fight. So let me know uh, if the audio sounds good or anything like that cuz if it if it doesn't sound good maybe I will try to put out another video tomorrow I'll try to figure out what's going on but uh yeah um besides that man I already got quite a few bets for this card. I like this card a lot from a betting perspective and if you haven't watched the Bellator predictions I put those up Monday and I got quite a few bets for that card as well. I think I got 6 bets on the Bellator card, maybe 5 or 6 and then I got um, close to 10 bets for this UFC card. So have quite a few bets. And I think I'm going to put a couple other bets um, on a couple other cards that are going down this weekend. So definitely don't want to miss that. Patreon.com slash every prediction gear. We've been doing really well this year on our bets and uh, predictions. So we're going to be looking to keep that going. And hit the like button, man. Subscribe down below uh, if you're not subscribed. And uh, put a comment. I would really appreciate that. Um, but let's get in this first fight of the night. You know, Muhammad Usman taking on Mick Parkin. Uh, heavyweight fight to me it's a pretty low level fight uh, I think Usman honestly is better than I give him credit for and better than people give him credit for at this point just because he's a heavyweight and he has certain intangibles that you know it's kind of difficult to beat him because he has good cardio he can wrestle fairly well and then he's very powerful so he can kind of control the pace with his counter punching and I think he's getting a little bit less sloppy and, and wild with his striking I think he, he is improving, um, and I see him wrestling hard in this fight. I think he's going to look to try to put Parkin against the cage, try to take him down, and then land the big punches. I think he's going to be the more explosive guy in there. And for Parkin, he just needs to use his technicality on the feet, try to get on those leg kicks early. If he can get on those leg kicks early and then mitigate that explosiveness from Usman, then he can stay on the front foot, walk him down, and be more confident in his boxing without getting countered. But I'm going to go with Usman here. I just think he's too good of an athlete. I think that he's going to be able to mix it up a little bit on Parkin, and I think he'll be able to land the bigger punches. I feel he's going to be the faster guy in there. He's going to be able to move around and make Parkin come to him and frustrate him a little bit. And if Parkin can't get the uh, leg kicks going early, I think the striking is going to be fairly close, but you're going to see Usman landing the more impactful shots. And then I think Usman's going to have some clinch control time. I think he might get a takedown or two. So I'm going to lean towards Muhammad Usman via decision in that fight. And moving on to this next fight, we got a great fight between two prospects with Igor Seferino and Andre Lima. Andre Lima, good kickboxer. I don't really know about his grappling and wrestling defense. I feel like it looked a little bit weak, honestly. Um, Decent takedown defense, but he was facing lower level wrestlers and still allowing them to take him down in certain portions of the fight. And it seemed like he had pretty good defensive grappling, his get ups and uh, everything were on point. But I do kind of worry about Seferino maybe catching him in a submission. Seferino's a very explosive guy. He goes out there and really pushes the pace early, throws big punches. And on the feet, he's going to be a little bit lost with Lima if it stays there long term. He just doesn't have that great technicality like Lima does, but I think he's going to throw hard enough and he's going to be able to get himself into wrestling, grappling situations, mix it up. And I think a submission for Igor Seferino is a good bet. I saw it's at pretty high odds. Um, it's taken some money now. It was at like plus 700 at one point. But I think Seferino is definitely live for a submission. I feel like he can catch Lima on the ground. I think he just needs to really push the wrestling here, try to make it more of a grappling match, and he can't fall in love with this power and just throw bombs with Lima because he could get caught against a more technical striker. But I just lean towards the underdog. I think he's more well-rounded overall. I feel like he's going to bring it a little bit more and be a little more aggressive. And I think that him starting off fast could be a good factor in the fight because it could get him moving downhill. And then I think he could eventually uh, find that submission. So that's what I like there. I like Igor Seferino, and I'm going to say he wins this fight on the ground. And... Moving on to this next fight here, we got Montserrat Rendon taking on Daria Zelnikova. And we actually cashed on Montserrat Rendon in her last fight. She was a pretty significant underdog. And we were able to predict her to get the victory at like over 2-1. to one, Made some money. I felt like that 
matchup was a lot easier in this matchup. I don't know why she was such a big underdog in that fight with Vidal. Vidal is terrible striking, terrible cardio, and just kind of a dangerous girl. But uh, Rendon was able to use the pressure and her kind of... Her boxing isn't great. She's really robotic. But she brings that pressure. She throws one-twos down the pipe. She keeps it basic. She does occasionally move her head off center line. Um... And she has really good grappling credentials, but she doesn't have the wrestling really to get fights to the ground. I mean, you see her push goes against the cage, and um, I just think her wrestling looks really, really bad. Uh, but if she can get on top of Zel Zelina Kova in this fight, we've seen uh, Daria really struggle off her back. She got finished pretty quickly in one fight where she got taken down. She got mounted, and she was really uh, looking a little bit lost on the mat there. Uh, I do think that Zel uh, Zelina Zakova is really tough. I think that she's going to be hard to finish. I feel like that stoppage that she got on her record was an early stoppage. But Rendon will dominate if she gets on top. So to me, that's her path to victory. And you look at Daria... Zel uh, fuck, I'm struggling with that name. You look at Daria... Um, she has good fluid striking. I feel like she's the way better kickboxer on the feet here. She's going to be able to land on Rendon, catch her as she comes in, and walk her down and be effective off the front foot or the back foot, whichever way she has to fight. And it seems like her clinch defense is decent. Like she was able to uh, defend a submission or the uh, takedowns from Jojua and a couple other girls. And I don't think Rendon really brings a great wrestling game. So ultimately, I feel like Zel um, Daria is going to be able to finish her on the feet potentially. I think that that's a live option. And I think she could win a fairly dominant decision just using her striking. As long as she doesn't gas out, then she should be the significantly faster and superior technical striker. So I think that's how she gets to win here and wins this fight. Most likely via decision, but I think a KO TKO is on the table there. If she could just get her uh, hands going in combination and start to really flow out there but we're gonna keep it going we got steven Wynn taking on jarno aarons in this fight and this one's uh two strikers i think jarno aaron is is going to be a, a lot happier with this matchup than some of the other matchups he had in the ufc where guys are trying to take him down he's not gonna have much of a threat of the takedown here and if he does get taken down by steven Wynn, we haven't really seen steven Wynn. Uh, his grappling and one thing we do know about Jarno Aaron's even though he can get held down by certain guys his grappling is, is fairly good like if he can get on top he's going to be dangerous and even off his back he could throw up submissions and sweep you so I feel like he's going to have the grappling advantage just because I've never seen Win really want to use grappling in his fights and therefore I think he's going to try to just fight his regular style of stand-up and Aaron's is probably going to get the fight he wants you look at Steven Nguyen um Good pressure. I feel like he's kind of basic. You know, he comes forward, high guard, throws a lot of one-twos. Um, and he has good hand speed and decent power. But nothing special for him, really, from what I see. I feel like he has fought some really low-level competition as well. Jarno Aarons, he hasn't won in the UFC. But he's had some moments. Like, he dropped, I believe, two opponents. And he definitely has power. He has good boxing. I feel like... He has the superior boxing in this fight and movement. He just needs to... I feel like Wynn is going to want to try to goad him into a brawl in the pocket. And Aaron's just has to stay moving around and work those strikes up the middle. Uppercuts, knees, catch him as he's coming in. And don't really brawl with Wynn because I think Wynn is a pretty good brawler. He's throwing those straight punches that can connect and he has fast hand speed. So if he can get... Aaron's to stand in front of him and have that kind of fight, it's going to become a lot closer than I think it needs to be. If Aaron's is moving around, um, using his speed and footwork, and then throwing those shots up the middle, I just think he's going to be able to land something on Wynn, like an uppercut, a knee, and get him out of there. I mean, we saw Wynn get knocked out by a long cruise with a flying knee. I saw Theo Relang, who looked like a really small 145er and was not very skilled, tag up Steven Wynn with a lot of strikes uh, uppercuts shots going up the middle and Aaron's has a really nice uppercut you know I feel like Aaron's can land there and get the knockout here so that's kind of where I'm leaning I think Jarno Aaron's is the more proven commodity even though Steven Wynn he is on more of a win streak recently and he may be you know on paper looks like the guy you should pick to win I think Aaron's has fought the better competition 
And I feel like he's going to go out there and probably be able to find the knockout on Stephen Wynn, who I'm not really sold on as a UFC level fighter. So Jarno Aarons is going to be the prediction for me there. And this next fight, Miles Johns versus Cody Gibson. Really difficult fight to predict here. I see a lot of people like very confident, like putting their flag on the Cody Gibson side. And I personally don't really understand that. I mean, the guy's 35 years old. And yeah, Miles Johns is a known gasser. And I, I see everyone, you know, really shitting on Miles Johns for his cardio. But Cody Gibson is also a, a really bad cardio guy. I mean, the guy gasses out hard, even though he's uh, training in New Mexico. You see his fight with like Ray Borg. Um, even his fight with Brad Katona, his last fight, it's like the third round, middle of the second round, the guy's dead tired. He's getting clipped with huge shots and he let Katona, you know, get back in the fight and take over and win the fight because he was too tired. But Gibson goes out there really good in the first round. He's a huge 135er and he is the more technical, better striker. Like he can control distance better. He, um, has more variety. I think his knees and kind of, if he can start to get his combinations going, they could be successful. But Gibson, once he starts to get tired, second and third round, he's really just throwing one strike at a time. That whole kind of fluidity and footwork and all that, um, the feints, the good knees, they all kind of go away. And it's just him trying to land a big punch and wrestle. And obviously he is a wrestler at heart. That was where he came up and started at. But Miles Johns, uh, striking kind of low level, like he doesn't like to get pressured even though he has big power, I mean, like the guy has a nasty jab, and if he lands his uh, check hook or his or his right hand, he could sit you down. He could hurt you, and I think that he could potentially rock Cody Gibson. Like if Cody Gibson is getting hit with those same strikes that he was getting hit with Brad Katona with at the same clip, he probably is going to get knocked out. Um, Johns, you know, he doesn't have a lot of finishes. He's very low volume and kind of just relies on the jab and counter punches and his power to keep guys at bay and then obviously his wrestling is really good as well even though he doesn't have the cardio to really implement that in too many fights this fight to me is like a crapshoot like Cody Gibson early is going to be the superior guy but I think once he starts to get tired they're both going to settle in be lower volume and be kind of uh you know a sloppy fight and ultimately I think that the power of Miles Johns may be the difference and just him being able to stay technical when he's tired, whereas Cody Gibson gets real wild and ugly. And yeah, I, I don't really get why people are so confident in Cody Gibson this week. If you're one of those people, put down in the comments why and um, what I'm missing, you know. Uh, but I'm going to pick Miles Johns to win via decision. And moving on here, we got Ricardo Hamo. She's taking on Julian Juicy J. Erosa. And personally, I, I like this fight for Hamo. I think that. He is going to be better everywhere in this matchup. Um, Arosa, obviously, he's a fun guy to watch. He does a good job with making fights crazy. And when he can get into a brawl, he's a beast and very dangerous. But I think that the jab of Hamos is going to be a big factor. I think the kicks of uh, the leg kicks of Hamos are going to be a factor. And I just feel like he's going to be able to not get drawn into that brawl. Arosa doesn't really jab that much. And he, even though he's a pressure guy, he does go backwards a lot early in fights recently. Like you'll see him kind of backing up and trying to catch you with that big right hand. Um, and I think Hamosh, he struggles more with guys that are really heavy with the pressure, that have good jabs, that have more kind of, Real technical, solid, striking on the front foot. And I don't really see that from Arosa. I feel like Arosa leaves too many openings to pressure Hamosh. If he does, Hamosh is going to find something sweet and catch him with it. Like one of those spinning attacks or a, a big counter. And I feel like in the pocket, Hamosh can get off with the jab. He can get off with that check hook. And I think he could land the overhands too. It's just he doesn't want to brawl with Arosa. And he doesn't want to force the wrestling like if he can wrestle and get a takedown or two at the end of the rounds that's going to be a good good way for him to seal rounds with the judges but if he's getting pressured and shoots bad takedowns sloppy takedowns that's where Arosa is really slick with those front chokes and if you get in Arosa's guard and you're tired he will throw up submissions threaten you and potentially get you out of there so he's a, a dangerous grappler so is Hamosh I think Hamosh 
is going to be able to shut down the wrestling of Arosa. We saw Arosa, you know, wrestle Akeem Dawudu and a couple other guys that he was able to get the victories over. But I don't see him being able to take down or out wrestle a guy like Hamosh. And I just feel like Hamosh is going to be able to be the more technical guy at range, at distance, be a little bit more active. And I think that if Arosa does go that route where he's pressuring and getting wild, which you know he's eventually going to do it in the fight, that's just who he is. He's not someone that's going to be um, patient and find smart for 15 minutes. And when he does that, I think Hamos can touch that chin. I don't trust Arosa's chin. I mean, he's got knocked out seven times his last two fights in a row. The last one you could say was an early stoppage, but that head kick he had against Bruce Leroy, he was hurt bad. So... I think Hamos can get him out of there, knock him out. I'm going to say he wins via second round KO, TKO in this fight. And we're moving along. We got Trey Ogden versus Kurt Holaba. And I actually have a pretty confident pick on this one with Trey Ogden. Uh, Kurt Holaba is a guy that I won a, a bet on in his last fight. I'm actually a fan of his style. Um, I think that he's a fun guy to watch. He has good pressure, great chin, um, throws big punches, that big right hand. Uh, if, you can, if you keep him in the pocket... Holaba's good in the pocket, and he has power, and he could sit you down. But I feel like he's really going to struggle with the jab of Kurt Holaba or of Trey Ogden. Trey Ogden's jab is nasty, and Trey Ogden is underrated, man. I mean, the guy has great footwork. He moves around really well. He's very hard to hit clean, and um, really good job of kind of curling and angling with shots and kind of just catching you, moving out of the way like a matador. And Kurt Holabaugh's a bull. He's going to be coming. I think that Trey Ogden's going to be able to offset him with some kicks, with the jab especially. And then Ogden could take him down too. I think Ogden can mix in some takedowns. Kurt Holabaugh is a very good grappler. So if Trey Ogden does take him down, he just needs to be careful with his neck. He can't get caught in a guillotine or something. He does have to worry about Kurt Holabaugh throwing up arm bars and things like that. And um, he doesn't want to let Kurt Holbaugh get on top of him. Like we saw with Austin Hubbard, when Kurt Holbaugh got on top, he quickly transitioned into a really slick triangle and got the finish. Um, but Trogdon's a black belt. He's a good grappler as well. And I think he's the better wrestler. And ultimately, I just think he's going to be way faster on the feet. He's going to be slick. He's going to be hitting, not getting hit. He's going to be offsetting Kurt Holbaugh's big punches with stinging jabs and with front kicks up the middle and things that are just touching more than... Uh, really being super powerful, but I think it's going to really offset and hurt Holabaugh from getting going. And I think he could, if Holabaugh does kind of start backing him up and putting his hands together, he could take him down. And I think that could really stymie Holabaugh as well. So Trogdon to me via decision is a pretty good pick there. And this next one, we got Luis, P uh, I mean, Luis Pujuelo taking on Fernando Padilla. Yeah. And, uh, this is another fight where I have a pretty confident read. I see a lot of people, um, or certain people that are going with the dog with Pajuelo, Pajuelo in this one. But for me, personally, I'm all over uh, Fernando Padilla. I think that Pajuelo is not very good. Like, I'm not really a big fan of this guy. I think he has okay boxing. He goes to the body. But I feel like he makes a lot of amateur mistakes with the striking, man. I mean, the guy's are, like standing right in front of guys like where they're <laughs> literally like both flat-footed in a phone booth and he's throwing punches like out of range, like where he's missing on every punch in the combination. It's like, it's like really amateur level, certain things that he does, but obviously the guy has great heart and could take a beating and just come forward, um, eat the shots and eventually break you down and take you out of there. But with a guy like Fernando Padilla, that's really sharp, slick striker that could fight off the front foot, can fight off the back foot, has knockout power, um, is a better grappler, could potentially mix in the takedowns and submit Pajuelo. I just don't see a lot of outs for Pajuelo outside of Fernando Pio totally gassing out and just getting finished late. But even in this fight with Kyle Nelson, like people are really giving Padilla a lot of uh, slack for that fight. But I felt like it was a competitive fight and it's not like he totally gassed out and looked horrible in the later rounds. I mean, he, he still is there. He just His volume kind of fell off. But after having that experience of a loss and a decision after not having gone very long in, in a lot of your fights, I think that's a good learning lesson. And I think that that could jumpstart Padilla. And just the reach and the technical advantage that he has on the feet, I think, is is pretty gigantic. I just don't like uh, Pujuelo's striking style. And I think he's very reckless, very hittable. I don't necessarily see this guy as a UFC-level fighter. We'll see if he proves me wrong. But he's been going to war and being in really difficult back-and-forth fights with these lower-level 
Peruvian fighters, and I just feel like once he gets to this UFC level, he's not going to be able to compete with the technicality that these guys have, and I think he's going to be exposed. So I'm going to Fernando Padilla, and I think he's going to get the knockout. And Yusuf Salal versus Billy Q. This is another fight where there's some contention. It's going back and forth, um, and uh, people are on both sides. Billy Q, he's obviously a fan favorite. He's someone that always brings a war, and he's kind of made a name for himself as that fight of the night type guy. And he's taken on Yusuf Salal, who is coming back to the UFC. He got cut, I think, twice now, and he's came, and he's made his way back. So the guy definitely doesn't have doesn't quit on himself, and he's able to work his way back into into the UFC's graces and get back into the company. So I definitely think that Yusuf Salal is a very good fighter. But you look at all these guys match up. Billy Q, he's getting a little older, right? He's 35 years old. So I definitely think that's something you got to talk about. Like, I think he got knocked out by Edson. And then his fight with Damon Jackson, to me, that was a bad look. I mean, Damon Jackson is not known as a good striker. He's never really been a guy that could land uh, combinations with his hands or land punches clean on guys' chins at a good rate. And he was clipping Billy Q up. Like, he was boxing him up. He was doing a great job at the striking on Billy Q. And um, to me, that's that's a big red flag when you're getting pieced up by Damon Jackson on the feet. If you got a guy like Yusuf Salal that's able to move side to side um, way faster than Billy Q with his feet and then can kind of catch him as he comes in and move around him. And I also think Yusuf Salal could take down Billy Q. I think he really could take him down pretty easily. Um so I just feel like Yusuf Salah has a lot of advantages in this fight. He has the more technical striking. He is someone that's going to always be moving. He's not really going to give Billy Q that fight that he wants. He's going to be looking to catch him and then get out of the way. He's not going to sit in the pocket with him. And I feel like he's not going to get tired at all. Yusuf Salah is someone that gets better as the fight goes on. Billy Q, a lot of these guys that he's been able to beat, he's worn him down. They've gassed out and then he's beat him up and finished him or beat him up and won the decision. With Yusuf Salah, I don't see Yusuf Salah getting tired whatsoever. I think that he's going to be able to move around and have that footwork, mix in takedowns, and do whatever he wants for 15 minutes and um, have good cardio doing it. And ultimately, I think Billy Q is going to struggle with the skill level of Yusuf here and just the speed. I think Yusuf is going to be landing a lot of straight shots, moving a lot. I think that he's going to mix in some takedowns as well. And I just think Billy Q is going to really struggle to cut him off, back him up, and get him in a spot where he can really get to work with his offense. And Billy Q needs to put damage on guys to be able to outlast them in the later rounds or end up beating them later on. And with Yusuf Salah, I just don't think he's going to be able to land very much a consequence. I think Billy or, uh, Yusuf is going to be moving quite often. Like I said, he's not going to give Billy Q the fight that he wants. And I think he's going to be able to get the victory here. So Yusuf Salah for me is the pick. And I feel like this line is off. I think Yusuf Salah should be the favorite. So uh, that's just my prediction there. And this next one, this is the fight of the week for everybody that people are on both sides of. Very, um, a lot of bets on both sides. And for me, I'm going to be sitting this one out from that perspective. I'm not going to be betting on this fight. I feel like it's, it's a volatile fight that people are emotional about. Because, you know, obviously... They can, if someone has a real passionate read on one side and then you like the other guy, maybe that could kind of sway you to put a bet on him just because of whatever human nature, right? But um, you're looking at Peyton Taub versus Cameron Simon, two really young guys, guys that are going to be the future of this division most likely. And Cameron Simon coming off the first loss of his career, whereas Peyton Talbot still has that zero, he's undefeated. Uh, Talbot won his UFC debut, and uh, Simon. I think he's 2-1 or 3-1 in the UFC, but has done fairly well. And you look at how these guys fight, I mean, they're both really fun to watch because they push the pace and they go for the finish. So Peyton Talbot, he's someone that really just walks you down. Uh, early on, he takes a lot of shots. He's very durable and just kind of eats your punches, stays in your face, and then you'll start breaking you down with his technical combinations his speed and he's he's a really good diverse striker um I think his ability to mix it up and attack the body is going to be a big factor in this fight I feel like Simone 
leaves his body open, and there hasn't been a lot of opponents that have exploited that, but I feel like Peyton Talbot is going to land body punches. He's going to land that body kick early and often, in my opinion, and I think that's going to be a, a big factor in the fight because on top of Talbot's cardio, his pressure and everything like that, if he's attacking the body, ripping the body of Simone, and I know Cameron Simone has really good cardio as well, that could get him tired, that could get his hands starting to drop, and then Peyton could start to land some really nice shots up top as well. But Peyton Talbot, you know, he's just going to have to be worry, uh, weary early. I mean, Cameron Simone has that nasty uh, lead hook, really good uh, right hand, kind of awkward striking style, similar to Drikus, where they're kind of really, it seems like they have really big reactions sometimes, and they're just kind of like way out of position. But they have some style that they implement that's difficult to deal with because obviously they finish guys, and even when they look awkward, um, they can still make it happen. So... I think that Simone, he's going to have to rely on his power here because I don't really think he can compete with Talbot in terms of combinations, in terms of slickness. Um, he's more of a bo uh, head hunter, whereas Talbot's going to be going to the body and the head and the legs. And I think Simone needs to rely on his power, you know, rely on that chuck hook, try to move around a lot land big shots, get Talbot's respect, maybe drop him, hurt him a couple times. And then if you could take him down, then that's going to be a big factor in the fight. But I don't think he's going to be able to hold Talbot down. And I don't think he's going to be able to take him down in the later rounds. Maybe if he, if he takes him down, it'll be round one. But I think once Talbot kind of gets into the fight, he's going to be harder to take down and especially hard to hold down. And ultimately, I feel like he's going to be more active down the stretch and I think that the body shots are going to be kind of the reason why he wins this fight. I think you're going to see Simone start off really good. And then Talbot's going to get that body kick going. He's going to start landing it uh, effectively. And I think that's going to change the fight. I think you're going to see Talbot be able to build off that and then win a decision. Or I don't really see a finish. I mean, it is a possibility. Obviously, any Talbot fight, late in the fight, he can go out there and get the job done. He's been able to do it against pretty much everyone he's fought. But I'm going to say this one actually goes to decision. And I'm going to go with Peyton Talbot to get the job done here. And this next fight, Edmund Shabazian versus AJ Dobson. Difficult fight to call in my opinion. I mean, Edmund Shabazian won in four in his last five fights. And really has kind of fell off after being one of the biggest prospects in the UFC. Needs to kind of reinvent himself. And AJ Dobson, not really a super known guy yet. But you could definitely tell that even though he's 1-2 and two in the UFC, he's skilled and he's someone that could potentially maybe even compete with the top 15. It's just he needs to kind of shape a few things up. And Edmund Shabazian is a great fight to kind of get an idea of where AJ Dobson's at. Because you've seen Edmund Shabazian fight some of the best in the world and he has came up short. But he's done well in certain moments and he's been able to beat guys that are outside the top 15 pretty easily. So if AJ Dobson can go in there and give Edmund Shabazian a good fight, beat him, then we know that he's uh, pretty close to a top 15 competitor. But Edmund Shabazian, you know, came back after a long time off his last fight, fought Anthony Hernandez, who's a guy you don't want to fight after a layoff, and a guy that Edmunds is a nightmare style matchup for Edmund. But Edmund actually won the first round. He dominated the first round. He rocked Hernandez a couple times, he won grappling exchanges, he was on top, um, but you saw towards the end of that first round, Hernandez got back into it, Shabazian was fatigued, and then it was over after that. Second round, he was done, he got taken down, beat up, third round, taken down really early and finished. Um, so, really, he showed some improvements early on in the first round, but once the going got tough, he reverted right back to the Edmund that we knew that lost previously to Jack Hermanson, to Derek Brunson, and I don't know if necessarily this guy's going to turn the corner. You know, Anthony Hernandez is a tough guy to deal with for anybody, but when you keep having those same reoccurring mistakes and things happening in every fight, um, it's hard to think those things are going to get corrected. But in this fight with AJ Dobson, it's a different matchup. I mean, Dobson is a wrestler. Um, I could see Dobson trying to catch some kicks and get on top of control that way. We saw him do that in his last fight in the third round. He was able to catch a kick and control on top for a large period of the round. 
And I think that would be very smart. I mean, it looked like his top control was really good. And I think he will be able to hold down Shabazian if he can catch a kick and get him down. But AJ, to Edmonds' um, advantage in this fight, he doesn't have that ability to take him down. I don't think outside of catching a kick, he's not going to shoot a takedown like a double or get him in the clinch, take him down that way. I think it's going to have to be off a caught kick. But on the feet, AJ can compete too. And you see how these guys match up standing. Shabazian has a really nasty jab. And I think Shabazian, what he's going to be really trying to do is work in that jab, getting AJ to pull back off the jab one, two, and then throwing leg kicks and maybe uh, even mixing in wrestling. I wouldn't be shocked to see Shabazian try to be the wrestler in this fight just because I think that in his training, he's probably training a lot of wrestling all the time. And you saw with Hernandez, you know, he, he engaged in the grappling early and he was doing well before he got tired. So I, I think he will maybe have that as a game plan. But I really think it's going to be trying to... A.J. Dobson likes to pull counter and return with the one-twos. So if Shabazian can kind of get him to lean back and then throw leg kicks or shoot takedowns, they can kind of take away a lot of A.J.'s game with the counter one-two. But I ultimately feel like if Edmund goes that route, A.J. will be able to get back up. And I don't necessarily think Edmund is going to finish him on the ground. And I'm really worried that if Edmund wrestles early, he's not going to be able to sustain it late. And on the feet, I feel like it's like a 50-50 fight. AJ Dobson, really good eyes. He avoids shots really well and then returns with the one-twos. Um, but very basic. That's really all that he looks to do. And he can be low volume. So Edmund should kind of have an idea of what he wants to do to win this fight. It's just AJ Dobson has the cardio. He's going to be pressuring forward. He's going to be a lot bigger. I feel like Edmund is not that big of an 85er, and that's been a bit of an issue for him. And it's a hard fight to call. I mean, to me, it's like a 50-50 fight, and I think it's going to go to decision more than likely. Edmund never been submitted. He's been knocked out before with ground and pound, but we've never really seen him like dropped and beat up standing. And AJ, I don't think he's going to be able to finish him with a ground and pound or anything like that. Even if he takes him down, it's going to be a more control thing. And I feel like a AJ's cardio maybe will be the difference in a low level fight, a low volume fight optically if he's going forward. And when you got him at like a plus 175, to me, you got to pick AJ Dobson. So I'm going to go with Dobson here. And I think the over two and a half on this fight is a pretty good bet. I think it's going to go to decision. And I'll say A.J. Dobson wins a close decision in this fight. And next we got the heavyweights. And we got Carl Williams taking on Justin Toffa. I really like this matchup. I think it's a good matchup to see where both guys are at in the division. I think they're pretty close to the top 15. You look at Carl Williams. This guy is super explosive for heavyweight. Very fast. He's someone that used to fight at 205. And you see him at 239.5. So he's not really... A big heavyweight whatsoever but he's super strong even for being smaller and his speed gives him an advantage um his striking is not good whatsoever though i mean if he's forced to strike with Tafa, he's gonna get slept but carl williams you know heavy on his lead leg i think calf kicks for Tafa are gonna be something that he really looks for but williams he likes to work a really strong jab he has a good jab sharp jab and then he uses that jab to mix in the takedowns and he'll also explode in with like these wild uh, power punches and combinations where he can close distance really fast. He has great hand speed, very explosive guy, but very reckless, wild, wide open. And uh, Toff is going to have a chance to counter and catch him. But Williams has good wrestling for heavyweight. He can elevate and get big slams on big guys, which you don't really see. Like you saw him lift and slam Lucas Presky, and he looked like shocked that Williams is able to do that. But um, what happens is on top, Carl Williams really isn't that good. Like, he doesn't have finishing ability, and he lets guys stand up from under him. And you saw, like, his fight with Bresky and the fight with Chase Sherman. Periods of that fight, he was exhausted on the feet, and his opponents couldn't take advantage of it. But that's going to be something that he needs to correct. Like, if Williams can't have top control time, he gets really tired, and... He has to be able to maintain his gas tank and not get reckless to get the takedown as he gets up in, in level and just be more confident in his stand-up. But I think that with Tafa, that's gonna be you're not gonna be confident in the stand-up with Tafa, a guy that's one of the fastest 
uh, heavyweights with hand speed. I feel like he has some of the best hand speed in the division. He's southpaw. He has that laser left hand, um, really nasty jab. Leg kicks are decent. I think he's going to have to go inside leg kick in this one and uh, try to work the jab early and often. I would attack the body too because Williams gets tired and attacking the body makes it easier to eventually defend takedowns, which are definitely going to come. But if this fight stays standing, Tafa is going to knock him out. And I have a good confidence in that. It's just we haven't really seen any grappling at all from Justin Tafa. It's very few and far between and takedown um, defense. Like, I think he's only defended two takedowns in the UFC. Uh, Carlos Felipe tried to take him down. Harry Hunsucker tried to take him down. Um, the only time we really saw him on the ground was with Hunsucker, where he actually did show good um, defense on the Kimura and it seemed like he knew what he was doing on the ground. But obviously, Harry's Hunsucker is like super low level, so it's hard to really gain anything out of that. But Tafa, you know, he's a short guy. He's someone that's going to be hard, in my opinion, to get under. And it's going to be nerve-wracking to want to close the distance because you know he's going to be looking to time something as you come in. And I think Tafa's cardio is underrated. I feel like he's going to have the better cardio here. So I think that's going to be one of his advantages. And he's a lot bigger. Like the guy weighs in 265. You see right there that on fight day he was 286. If he can defend a couple takedowns and be heavy on Williams... He'll get him real tired, and um, ultimately, I think Tafa's going to knock him out here. I'm going to go with Tafa via first round knockout, and uh, I think that's a good bet. I, I don't really get why Williams is the favorite in this matchup. You, I get it with the wrestling, but I think Tafa, you know, his wrestling is going to be better, and wrestling defense and submission defense get-ups are going to be a little bit better than people anticipate, and I think that it's going to be hard to get in and get the takedown on him in general over these other guys that weren't really that precise. And I just think Tafa is going to be able to knock him out here. I think Carl Williams is a very good prospect. I think he has a lot of potential, but he's raw and he makes mistakes on the feet. I don't think he's necessarily dangerous on the ground. So even if he takes down Tafa for a full round, I don't see him finishing him. And I think Tafa can knock him out. So I'm going with Justin Taffa. I'll say he wins me a first round KO, TKO here. And we got the main event. We got the ladies here. We got Amanda Hebos taking on Rose Nama Yunus. Two girls that used to fight at 115 that are now fighting up at 125. Obviously, Rose Nama Yunus, uh, one of the best straw weights of all time. She's a two time champ. She has wins over the other best girls in the division, like Wheelie Zhang, like Yuani and Jacek. But. Her last fight, she moved to 125. She fought Manon Firo, who's now going to be in a number one contender fight for her next bout. And it was competitive. I mean, Rose won the third round. She was picking it up. I think she dropped Manon in the third round. And um, it was a little bit, you know, too little, too late, right? He, she lost the first two rounds. Early on in the fight, she had a really um, kind of unfortunate thing happen where she broke her finger on her dominant hand so that really kind of mitigated a lot of what she wanted to do I feel like but the third round Manon slowed down and Rose used that experience to kind of pick it up on her and this fight is going to be five rounds but with this matchup Amanda Hebos is a cardio machine so I don't see that five rounds being you know a big difference for either girl both girls are going to be able to go five rounds at a good clip but Amanda Hebos she's coming off a win herself where she was able to have a really rough first round with Luana Pinero where she got beat up really bad, but she ate the shots, kind of Amanda Hebos kind of style, what she usually brings, you know, grittiness. And she was able to take that second round and then finish in the third round with the highlight reel spinning kick. So she's going to have some confidence coming in here. And obviously this is going to be the biggest fight of her career. It's going to be a chance to get her in the title picture. And Rose Nama Yunus, it's a chance for her to kind of tell people y'all must have forgot like Roy Jones, right? Because Rose Nama Yunus, you know, her last fight after she lost, there was people calling for her to retire. There was a lot of questions about what she was going to do with their career, but she came out really quick. And I think she kind of called all that and said, no, you know, I felt good. I feel like I'm going to stay at 125 and be competitive. So I think she has a chip on her shoulder now that she's in this new division that, hey, I'm going to come out here and I'm going to show something 
then I'm still here and I'm still viable and I'm going to make a run in this weight class. So I think she's going to be motivated for this fight. Um, a lot of people are bringing up that Trevor Whitman's not in her corner for this one. She He wasn't for her last fight, so that could play a factor. And I don't disagree with that, but I still think that Rose will be ready to go. Um, you're looking at how these girls match up. I feel like Amanda Hebos, you know, her style is, is pretty obvious what she wants to do. She's going to pressure you. She's going to try to really weaponize her cardio and push a super high pace. And then she has fast hands and kind of that herky-jerky striking style where she's like fainting a lot. And then she lands that the jab or the check hook and she'll come in with the right hand kind of off timing. Like she's real kind of weird with the striking, but she has good hand speed and she's willing to stay in the pocket and throw. So she can land, you know, some nice right hands, decent one-twos and combinations. She dropped uh, Vivi Oroju, um, but defensively she really really is a major major liability like she when she starts to punch and get into an exchange she floats her chin in the air and her, her head never moves off center line she's um right there to be hit in exchanges i feel like with rose in this fight that head kick is going to be very very um available for her from that southpaw stance and i think the check hook and he boss likes to fight kind of moving forward moving backwards she doesn't have great lateral footwork side to side and when girls can move side to side on her you know land check hooks um kind of touch and move on her they could really start to land clean and um another thing that rose is gonna be able to land all day is that straight um left straight right overhand left overhand right i think that's gonna land at will on he boss i think she's a lot more polished in terms of setups and throwing slick uh stuff on the inside too and catching girls so i just feel like he boss is gonna have a lot less chances to win i mean she's obviously gonna bring that pressure and um try to force rose into more exchanges and push the cardio but i don't see rose getting tired and i think rose is gonna have more power than some girls that she's been facing in the past kind of like macy barber did and hurt he boss when they're in these exchanges and i think that's Going to make Hebos want to wrestle more. So I do think that the judo could potentially be there. Maybe she could take Rose down a couple times. And that is going to be her path to victory, in my opinion, is using that judo, getting on top, and controlling Rose. But ultimately, I think she's going to find it hard to find Rose because Rose is going to be moving side to side. She's going to be making Amanda come to her. And she's going to be countering really crisply. I think she's going to be able to catch Hebos early and often. And... Even if she's taken down, I think that Rose will be prepared for that a little bit better in this fight, hopefully have some attacks that she can go to off of her back. We've seen Hebos kind of be lazy in the full guard and kind of let fighters get close on submissions, and maybe Rose could make something happen there, but obviously Rose is going to be wanting to keep this fight on the feet, and um, I think if she can do that, she probably can find the finish. It's just Rose by KO is like plus 140, which sucks. I mean, usually you can get a lot better odds on her. Like, I bet her to win by KO, TKO against uh, Wee Lee. And I bet her uh, money line the first fight, she was like a huge underdog. And I think it was like plus 1,200 on the KO. But now it's like the KO line is pretty shit to me. And uh, that's because Hebos doesn't have that chin, right? But, um... Yeah, I'm going to go with the Rose in this one to get the job done. I'll say she wins via third round KO, TKO, but I kind of feel like it's it's a pass fight. You know, I think Kibos has a lot of um, issues, you know, defensively. I think her chin is suspect, and against Rose, someone, that's a, someone that goes out there and takes your chin, I don't necessarily know if it's a good matchup. But the same thing with Rose, even though I'm saying... That I think she's going to be motivated. I don't know that for sure. If she comes out here as kind of a lackluster performance again. Hebus will win just off volume and being active. And being kind of the way that she fights with a lot of pressure and grittiness. So Rose needs to be um, you know, locked in on the night. And if she is, I think she'll get the job done. And I think she'll win inside the distance. So I'm going to predict Rose wins via third round KO TKO in this fight. So there you have it guys. That's the full card breakdown and predictions video for 
UFC Vegas 89, Rose Namajunas versus Amanda Hibas. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Really appreciate everyone that watched. Make sure to hit the like button. Comment down below if you agree or disagree with my predictions, what you feel, and um, put likes. Let's try to get 100 likes on this video. I'd really appreciate that. But as far as uh, most confident pick on this card, um, that's a, a lot of these fights are very close. I would say I'll go with uh, Trey Ogden as my most confident pick. But as a part of the week, I'm just going to give you a play of the week, and that's going to be on Justin Toffa. I think Justin Toffa is going to get the job done this week. Um, pretty confident. I've actually um, seen him wrestle grapple before with certain guys, and, and uh, I think he's going to show a little bit more than what people think. So I think Toffa is going to get the win there. And um, yeah, there you have it, guys. Thanks for watching this video. Sorry for it being out so late, but still show love, man. Hit the like button, subscribe, um, comment down below. And I'll talk to you guys later. And I'm going to be probably putting out maybe another free bet video on the channel before tomorrow night. So make sure to check that out. Be locked in the channel and you might be able to make yourself some money tomorrow night off of a video that I dropped. So thanks for watching, guys. And I'll talk to you guys later.